you will be using a weak acid or weak base and its conjugate salt in order to make a buffer. I have selected to use sodium acetate as my salt and acetic acid as my weak acid. Both solutions are 0.1 molar. I've already taken and poured some into each of my beakers. I'm now going to take and add equal parts into my test tube. I have decided to do two milliliters of each. So I will start with my acetic acid, then I will take and use my sodium acetate in equal volumes. So now I've added two mils of each into my test tube, mixed it together, and now I'm going to be adding several drops of universal indicator solution to check its pH. Here is my indicator chart, and if I take my test tube, we can see that I am sitting near the 4 to 4.5 range, so we are in the acidic range. Now I'm going to be taking and making a dilution of my acetic acid to create a new buffer. I'm going to do a 1 to 10 dilution, so I'm going to take 1 milliliter of my acetic acid into my 10 milliliter graduated cylinder. Then I'm going to dilute it up to the 10 mil mark with my deionized water. And now that I have this as my new one to 10 dilution, I'm going to be taking equal parts of my diluted acetic acid and sodium acetate and making a new buffer. I'm going to quickly tap to make sure that my acetic acid and water are thoroughly mixed to dilute. And I'm going to take two milliliters of my dilution into a new test tube, and then two milliliters of my acetic acid. Mix. And now I will be adding universal indicator again to check the pH of my solution. Now comparing my two solutions side by side, you can see that my dilute is a lighter color of orange, so taking it, this was our original between 4 and 4.5, but our new one is sitting between 5 and 5.5 for its orange hue, so we have diluted the pH by about a factor of 1, which is what we would expect. We diluted the acid by a factor of 10, which would make our pH increase to a more basic level by a factor of 1. Next, I'm going to be taking and making a second dilution of my acetic acid. So I will take my 1 to 10 dilution, and I'm going to need 1 milliliter of my 1 to 10, adding it to a new graduated cylinder, dilute up to my 10 milliliter mark with the ionized water, and now this new dilution is a 1 to 100 dilution, since I've diluted it by another factor of 10. So now, tap again in order to thoroughly mix, and then I will need equal parts. So another 2 milliliters of my now extra diluted acetic acid, and then 2 milliliters of my sodium acetate. And again, I will check my pH using universal indicator. And as you can see from our new solution, our 1 to 100 dilution of acetic acid has caused this buffer to not go from our 4 to 4.5 or a 5 to 5.5. We have instead increased up to between 7 to 8 in our color. Since we have a greenish color, I would put this solution at about a 7.5 pH, which is an extreme step up from what we would expect of just another change of 1 in its pH. In this part, I have taken and boiled distilled water and added universal indicator. I have separated it the solution equally, or the boiled water equally into these two test tubes. As you can see, they are both an olive green color, which according to our pH paper, or our pH uh, color chart, is a pH of 7. Now I'm going to take 
these two solutions and add five drops of hydrochloric acid and five drops of sodium hydroxide to the different solutions in order to show the change in pH. So to this test tube I will add five drops of 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide. As you see I have a nice violet color. To the next solution or to the next test tube I will add five drops of hydrochloric acid. In this one I've gotten a very uh, deep red or pink. Taking these two solutions and comparing them, if we look at our chart, they both fit at the very ends of the spectrum. My pink or red one sits at a pH of 4, possibly lower, but that is where our chart ends. And our violet sits at a pH of 10, possibly higher, but again, that is where our chart ends. And that is the pH change when we add strong acid or strong base to our distilled water with indicator. Next, we will be doing and repeating what we just did with boiled water and indicator with our buffers that we originally made. So to start, I have my original buffer of equal parts acetic acid and sodium acetate. I'm going to take this and divide it between these two test tubes equally. Now I have two equal solutions. And then to each of these buffers, I'm going to add either hydrochloric acid or sodium hydroxide as we did before. Since these buffers already have indicator in them, I do not need to add any universal indicator. So to my left test tube of buffer, I will add five drops of hydrochloric acid. And now to the right, I will add five drops of sodium hydroxide. Now, as you can see, the color of both of our buffers did not change whatsoever. This means that there was no pH change and our buffers functioned as we would expect. Next, I'll be moving on and using the first set of dilutions that I made. So I will have my 1 to 10 dilution of acetic acid with sodium acetate. And I'll be repeating as I just did with my original buffer. I will divide this dilute buffer into two parts. And I will take them and to the left one, I will add five drops of hydrochloric acid and observe what happens. To the right, I will add five drops of sodium hydroxide and observe what happens. As you noticed, my right one ended up changing from a light orange to a dark uh, deep violet. My left one changed from a light orange to a dark orange, which means that our buffer functioned momentarily and then started to lose in its buffer capacity. As we see with our right one, we exceeded the buffer capacity and ended up going very basic. With our right one, we started to go slightly more acidic, but we still stayed within our buffer capacity. Next, I'll be using my final buffer, which was my 1 to 100 dilution of acetic acid and sodium acetate. I will take and separate into equal parts between the test tubes, add hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. And as you can see here, we started with a green solution, which by our indicator chart would mean that we are at about a neutral pH to slightly basic. And I have instead, with sodium hydroxide, immediately changed to fully basic at a pH of 10. And when I added hydrochloric acid, I have gone back and gone quite acidic down to a pH of about 5 to 4.5. So as we see with our very dilute original buffer, it did not function very well as a buffer. It resembles deionized water. With my 1 to 10 dilution, it functioned partially as a buffer, which is what we would expect. It is not as good as our initial one, but it still is within acceptable range. And our original buffer showed no change at all, 
meaning that it functioned exactly as we would hope for a buffer. Now we are moving on to part 3D. For this part, I am going to be taking my acetic acid, which is the weak acid I have chosen to work with. And I'm going to be taking and measuring out 25 milliliters into each of my two Erlenmeyer flasks. I have 25 milliliters measured out, poured into one of my flasks. Now I'll measure out the second round. I now have another 25 milliliters of acetic acid into my second flask. Now you should calculate how many moles of acetic acid are in each flask. Our calculations show that we have 0.0025 moles of acetic acid in each of our flasks. Next, I'll be taking one flask and titrating it to the end point with 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide. Now I have my 25 milliliters of 0.1 molar acetic acid and I have a 50 mil burette here filled with my 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide. I'm going to take my phenothaline indicator and add five drops to my acetic acid swirl. As you can see, our solution is still colorless. Phenothaline does not start with any color as an indicator. And now I will start to titrate my solution. Phenothaline becomes pink in the presence of base, so I'm waiting till I see a pink color start to retain in my solution. I expect to use about 25 milliliters of sodium hydroxide in order to titrate my acetic acid. As you can see, it is taking ever longer for my solution to lose its pink color. I now have a very light pink maintaining in my solution, and it is not disappearing as I swirl. Since I'm suspecting that I am done, I'm going to record the volume of sodium hydroxide I used, which is 22.3 milliliters. I have taken the flask that I just titrated with and added one more drop of sodium hydroxide. And as you can see, it is now a very deep pink color and it is not going away when I swirl, which means by adding just that single drop of sodium hydroxide, I have over titrated the solution and I have exceeded my endpoint. As you can see, phenothaline is an indicator that you need to titrate with very carefully in order to make sure you do not over titrate your solution. Here I am titrating my uh, 25 milliliters of 0.1 molar acetic acid. I have a 50 mil burette with 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide. I'm going to be taking my phenothaline indicator and adding five drops into my acetic acid flask. As you can see, our solution is colorless. Phenothaline turns pink in the presence of base. So I'm going to start my titration and be very, very careful that I do not exceed the end point. I'm expecting to use somewhere around 25 milliliters of sodium hydroxide in order to titrate this solution. But I'm going to go until I see a very, very faint pink color in my flask. I have begun to add dropwise my base because it is taking ever longer for my indicator to fade from my solution. And as I said, I do not want to over titrate my sample here. As you can see, I've over titrated the solution. With just a little slip of my hand, I accidentally added several drops in one go rather than just one, and I over titrated my solution. So now I'm going to have to remeasure out 25 milliliters of acetic acid and titrate again. 
Here I have my flask filled with 25 milliliters of 0.1 molar acetic acid. As you can see, I'm having pink come in and fade quickly in my solution, but I'm adding drop wise because I want to be very cautious as I approach my end point. I only want to titrate until there is a barely visible pink indicator in my solution. I have now reached my end point. I can tell that there is a very faint pink hue to my flask, but as you can see, it is very difficult to capture on camera. I do not want to over titrate my sample, so I'm going to stop here and use this just to show you. Here is what an over-titrated phenothaline solution looks like. If I were to add even one drop more to my good solution here, I would end up getting to the over-titrated point. So after I let my flask sit for a moment, the indicator actually faded out, showing that I was not yet at the end point. So I added just one more drop and now after waiting, I have a very light pink solution showing that we have reached the actual endpoint fully. And I just want to show again the difference between an over titrated and correct endpoint of my solution. So we have our very, very deep pink shows that we've exceeded our endpoint and our light pink almost clear, showing that we are at our actual endpoint and have not exceeded it. Here is our flask uh, that first contained 25 milliliters of acetic acid. This is after we have titrated it. So now, since we have titrated it with 22.3 milliliters of sodium hydroxide, it now contains our sodium acetate salt instead. We need to calculate how many moles of salt we have now in this flask. According to our calculations, we should have 0.0025 moles of salt in our flask. Here I have my untitrated flask containing 25 mils of acetic acid and my titrated flask of acetic acid with sodium hydroxide now containing my sodium acetate salt. I'm going to take and combine them together. Now in my flask here, how many moles of weak acid do I have present? How many moles of sodium salt do I have present? And what is the final volume that I have here in this flask? As a reminder, I had 25 mils of acetic acid, another 25 mils of acetic acid, and I used 22.3 mils of sodium hydroxide in order to neutralize. Now that you have taken your time to calculate both the final volume and how many moles of sodium acetate salt and acetic acid are remaining in this flask, you should have come out and found that by our calculations, there is 0.0025 moles of acetic acid and 0.0025 moles of sodium acetate in this flask. So you have equal amounts of moles of acetic acid and sodium acetate, and you have a final volume of 72.3 milliliters in this flask. With all of that information, you should now be able to calculate the concentration of acetic acid and sodium acetate that we have. So for our last step, we need to take our pH probe and measure the pH of the buffer that we have just made. 
So since we have used acetic acid and sodium acetate to make our buffer, we are ending with a final measurement of 4.73 for our pH, which is exactly what we were hoping to see. Our ideal pH is 4.70. Now our iron oxalate has settled in our flask, so I'm going to take and collect it using our Buchner funnel. I'm going to be using distilled water to rinse out my flask. Now that I have rinsed out my flask, I'm just going to wash my product with distilled water several times. This eliminates any leftover solution in my product. Now that I am done, I can take and turn off my vacuum. Now you can see I have a nice yellow iron oxalate. Now I'm going to take that and add it a 125 milliliter beaker. I can take my 100 mils of DI water that I'm going to use to store it in to rinse it off from my filter paper. Now I have my iron oxalate which has been washed now sitting in 100 mils of DI water. Now I can take some parafilm. I can cut out square, remove it, and stretch it out. Then I can place it over the mouth of my bottle and seal. Now that I have a good seal, I can take the remaining parafilm and wrap it around the neck to maintain a nice good seal on my flask. Now I can let this sit until I need to use it for my experiment.